Welcome back to Face to Face. You might recognize the face beside me, Daniel Silk. You've probably seen him on TV. He's a political economy analyst and he advises companies locally and internationally. And he's in the media. Everywhere you look, everywhere you listen, there he is. Daniel, nice to see you again. Stuart, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Nice background you have there. And uh, well done for spelling your name correctly. I got that far right. I had a lot of education to get that far right. So there you go. So we've been working together for many years. We are today two months into lockdown. What, where, where do you start? Tell, tell, me, tell, me, tell me what your thinking has been as the two months have progressed. Well, look, Stuart, I think for everybody around the world, and not just uh, as a South African, but for everybody, this is really a real, it's a real-time experiment. Uh, it's a reality show of note that we all, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, have come, uh, have come to, to adapt to. Uh, look, in South Africa, I think we've seen, um, uh, you know, the shifting, the shifting sands of support for this very hard lockdown that we've had. And we have had a hard lockdown. I think, you know, when we look at some of the studies that have been done on lockdowns around the world, and there's one from the University of Oxford, it clearly shows that ours has been one of the most stringent anywhere on the planet. So it's no surprise then that over the last eight weeks or so, there's been a variety of emotions for all South Africans, from early acceptance, I think, of the regulations to a creeping fatigue and frustration with the management, implementation, micromanagement of these regulations. And I think it, you know, it, it, it's that shifting, shifting, it's not just public perception, it's actually a psychological adaptation or uh, a psychological barrier to the lockdown that has, I think, in the end prompted a major rethink along obviously with the extreme damage or the collateral damage that the lockdown has done to our economy. And I think we're all living with now the sort of adaptation to a, a different type of lockdown, a smarter lockdown going forward, which I think is positive for South Africa, but it holds, of course, substantial economic risk, health risk, and also political risk for President Ramaphosa uh, in its wake. So here we are, what, the day after the last announcement by the president. Give us a summary of what we should wait, be worried about and what's good about it. Well, look, clearly what's good about it is that we're allowing 8 million more people to go back to work on June the 1st. It largely restores most businesses uh, to active duty, albeit under uh, reasonable health uh, conditions. Uh, and it uh, begins a process of... Uh, uh, really restoring both the production and the demand side to our, our to our economy, both of which were artificially halted as a result of the hard lockdown. So it's a critical step to some sort of recovery, and that's the positive. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it does open uh, it does open the uh, possibility of a increase in COVID nineteen cases as we come into contact with each other to a much greater extent than before. Doesn't matter how many precautions you take, no doubt there may well be a spike. We're watching to see whether a spike occurs in the United States, uh, given that they've opened up most of their states, whether a spike occurs in Italy and Spain and the UK as well, to see whether that's uh, real or whether it's manageable. And I think for us in South Africa, the key will be whether we can react to these hotspots, the existing hotspots and any new hotspots can we shut them down quickly? Can we have a targeted, efficient response from our public health officials and the mechanisms in place, uh, rather than have the sort of blanket approach that has really negatively affected us from both an economic and a morale point of view? And that's going to be the test over the course of the next few months as we move into the peak period of COVID-19 here, perhaps from now until August into September. Now, <clears throat> what will you say to the people who, who are still half glass, half empty and saying, well, opening the shop doesn't mean I'm going to suddenly make money because a lot of people haven't got the money to spend. So that's not even an option. Nothing's going to just suddenly blossom, is it? 
No, nothing's going to blossom. You've got to start somewhere from this. And I think, uh, you know, it's fair that we have begun uh, on this particular track, but there are serious issues for us. There's the potential now of perhaps a million people or even more unemployed, adding to the very high unemployment figures in this country. There's the potential of just in Gauteng alone, an additional 1 million people who are now going to be looking for food parcels to get them through the next number of months. Uh, there's untold damage to the informal economy in South Africa. You know, we don't have that many jobs in South Africa, Stuart, but we've got a very uh, large informal economy that's probably been hit even harder uh, when you look at uh, the, survive, the, the ability of South Africans to survive off relatively low income streams. All of that is going to play itself out here over the next six months to the next year or even longer than that. And of course, it's not just an economic issue. There are also political implications for uh, risk within our society. Uh, clearly, uh, rising unemployment can create social unease and social distress. And that can play itself out as we move into local government elections, still scheduled for Mother. April or May of next year. The political terrain for President Ramaphosa and for opposition parties has certainly become more complex just as a result of this, let alone all of the other factors that were there prior to COVID-19. What would you say to the, the conspiracy theorists? And there's a lot of them around. I'm sure you're seeing them. You know, the whole, well, they're holding it back so that we can all become uh, nice, comfortable socialists, and all that kind of stuff. Do you think, has Cyril got a grip on it? Is he, is he steering the ship? Does he have... Or, or, or are there other people with different agendas to his? Look, I'm not a believer in the traditional conspiracy theory or anything for that matter. Uh, but I do think that uh, what we still have within the ANC is we have a difference of approach on ideology, on practice. Uh, and that difference of approach that was there prior to COVID-19 is there now, during and will be there after. And I don't think that the ANC itself has managed to gain any great clarity on the road forward and what kind of South Africa they'd like to have after COVID-19. So, you know, you're quite right to talk about the day after. And I think we should really be focusing on the day after because a lot of us would feel a lot better about the troubles we face today if, frankly, we knew what the day after might look like. And I think that's where the weakness really has been within the ANC. And they are still to resolve, what kind of economy do we have? Will it be a command and control economy? Will it be heavily into state-owned enterprises? Will it integrate the private sector into policy making and restore a degree of progress through greater cooperation between the state and the private sector? Those questions are as murky, frankly, uh, today as they were before. So the options really lie before us now to carve out that particular road. And I think that's the question that we really need to be asking now uh, of uh, both government and also of the civil society bodies that uh, inject their own view into South Africa going forward. Is this time being good for Cyril as a leader, as the president? Well, our president faces the same challenges that any other leader faces at this time. If uh, we in this country can keep a lid on the death rate, and for that matter, even on the caseload for our uh, public health facilities, then I think President Ramaphosa will clearly be strengthened as a result of that. And we've seen across the world uh, a leader like um, uh, President Erdogan in Turkey, who was on the back foot only six months ago. He's come through this COVID period quite well as a result of the management of the crisis. But we've seen a leader like Emmanuel Macron in France really find it tough going and is being severely criticized at the moment for his management. Uh, in fact, he's even lost his parliamentary majority um, in, in Paris. So I think that uh, for President Ramaphosa, COVID offers an opportunity. Run it well and you're gonna look good. But even if, even if you're not to blame yourself, and even if the broader structural, social healthcare facilities let you down, well, you the front of face, uh, you know, the buck stops ultimately with a leader. Uh, and I think that's where we could find potential weakness for him down the line. 
For the moment, if you're going to ask me, has he been strengthened? I would say that he has been moderately strengthened, moderately. Uh, the lockdown itself, unfortunately, was, I think, in many instances, mismanaged. And that cost him. It cost him support from the early days of that buy-in for many of us. He's trying to restore, I think, his relatively good name, the credibility that he had at the beginning of the crisis. He always has the potential to restore that. But I'm afraid it's quite, he's making heavy weather of it. And unless he can really get to grips with his own cabinet and with rolling out greater efficiencies, he may well struggle in the months to come. Okay, let's, let's wrap this one up with what, what do you see as our economic recovery? What are our chances? What's the timing? What, what, what do you see in your crystal ball? Well, look, the reality is we're going to face 1 million, 2 million unemployed. We're going to face a GDP decline here of perhaps a, a minus 10% or even in excess of a minus 10% or so. These are pretty dramatic figures. And the one thing that we, we really have to do, and that's why, to me, the roadmap for the future is critical here. We really have to bounce back to a position that's better than what we were in before COVID-19. It's no good going back to that position, although maybe some of us <laughs> would say, well, let's take what we can. But it's no good going back to a position where we were in a recession prior to COVID-19. We need to improve on that. Now, Stuart, go back and have a look at the last you know, 10 years in our economy. We didn't bounce back from the global credit crisis in 2008, 2009 sufficiently. Our, our, our graph of incline was always below other emerging markets, always below even developed world markets going forward. And we've got to reverse that. And we've got to make sure that those policy choices now actually propel us way above, or at least above, where we were before. And for that, you're going to need pragmatic, flexible, and agile thinking within the ANC. And when our president talks about radical economic transformation, absolutely. And his party is going to have to be at the core of a radical economic rethink going forward of their own policy. And I think if at least we can go some way to that, and for that we really do need the private sector to come to the party in an enabling environment from government to assist a recovery. The state, I'm afraid, is insufficient for this. And the state will have to accept that the private sector has a major role to play in that recovery. If that is a prevailing view, then I think we shouldn't be too despondent about where South Africa will be in two or three or four years time. It's a big if. It takes a mindset change for the ruling party in South Africa, but we should never assume that it's not possible. It may require a political change for many South Africans, but I think there is the possibility that government can get that one right. But if you are in government, Stuart, you're going to face a battle royal, I must tell you, and all of us observers will be watching that, whether you're a professional observer like myself or whether you're more of an armchair observer, perhaps like yourself as well. So buckle up and fasten your seatbelts on that one. I think also, you know, just in wrapping up, We've got, to, we've got to get across and the, and the ruling party has to realize that if they don't relax the regulations, if they don't enable the private sector to be able to do what the private sector is almost certainly capable of doing, because we are all having to reinvent and innovate, we're having to. If they don't allow it, goodness knows what our, what our conversation might be like together a year from now. Daniel Silk, thank you for your time. Thank you, Stuart. It's always a pleasure being with you. Thank you.